first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard Him, God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to His own will. For under the angels hath He not put in subjection the world to come whereof we speak, but one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crowdest him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now... We see not yet all things put under him, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. If you will, three more reasons to believe. The Hebrew audience of this New Testament letter or epistle uh, were a group of folks who knew the Bible, they were even comfortable with the Bible, but they were having trouble with the quote-unquote role of Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth. They'd heard much about Him, but they just couldn't make up their minds about what they had heard. And that, of course, is a major problem, because you can have your mind made up on every other issue. You can have every other matter in life decided. You can have every other question in life settled. But if you're not right on the subject of Jesus of Nazareth, you're simply not right. And that's the end of the subject. You can be religious, but you can't be Christian unless you're right on the subject of Jesus of Nazareth. People have been poking fun at Bible believers for a long time. You're narrow-minded. You're narrow-minded. At some point in time, you learn to take that as a compliment. Amen. We're as narrow-minded as the fellow who can look through a keyhole with both eyes at the same time when it comes to the Word of God. So tote that thing around, but if you miss Jesus, y'all, you're going to miss it all. So chapter 2 picks up, if you will, with a warning. We just read verse number 1. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we've heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. Now this principle applies to every area of life, uh, not just Jesus of Nazareth. It's easy, in other words, to let what you've heard or what you know slip away if you don't pay close enough attention. Husbands, have you ever forgot your wife's or in yours anniversary? Probably not a good time to own up to it, even if you have. How about you ever forgot your wife's birthday? You ever forgot uh, during a conversation between you and her the first time that you ever kissed? Well, Y'all ain't saying much. You're either dead between the ears or you're ashamed. I don't know what the deal is. But... How about you ever forget what you said to her on that certain moonlit night? I see tears coming some of out of y'all's cheeks. I know. Or change said, how about April 15th tax day? You ever forget things that you knew perfectly well? Well, if you're anything like me, you learn after a while knowing the importance of certain dates, certain times, knowing how easy it is to let these things slip our minds, knowing the tendency that I have to let things slip my mind, and then knowing the hot water I've got myself into in the past when these things slip from my mind, <coughs> excuse me, obviously, <clears throat> I ought to give a more earnest heed to those things that I've heard, lest I let them slip away. But this applies most specifically to Christ. Whether it be in the Hebrew audience or to all folks everywhere, what you've heard about Jesus from the Bible, what you've heard, what you know about Jesus from the Bible, we need to give the more earnest heed towards, or as a literal paraphrase, we ought to hold our minds toward those things. Statistics, don't you love them? Statistics show that a majority of the children raised in our Baptist churches, when they go to college, they leave the church. 
Statistics tell us that the kids in our Baptist churches, the majority of them when they turn 16 years old, get a driver's license, they start leaving the church. Now, not always, but sad to say it does happen. Statistics tell us that when a boy gets a girlfriend or a girl gets a boyfriend, they start pulling away from the church. Statistics tell us that when young folks out of our Baptist churches get married, they typically leave the church. Now, do these young people make conscious decisions? I don't want to serve Christ anymore. I think for the most part, no. Uh, they, we, we get distracted. Uh, our attentions uh, shift to other interests. They start, if you will, holding the mind toward other things. And then their focus on the church and their focus on the Bible and their focus on Jesus slips and other things become priorities. So to any of us, to all of us, and this is deep, listen real close, if we don't stay focused on the church, on the Bible, on Jesus, then we won't be focused on the church, on the Bible, on Jesus. The book of Hebrews, the study of the book of Hebrews, to me, only makes sense when you factor in that this Hebrew audience had religion and they had a zeal for God, but they did not, had not as of yet embraced the Jesus of the Bible. They would not focus entirely on the Jesus of the Bible. It's interesting to note, every other book in the New Testament, obviously, is about Jesus Christ. But no other book in the New Testament revolves so completely around who He is, what He's done, when He must be dealt with, where He's seen in the Old Testament, why He came. In light of these things, in our passage today, we see the Apostle giving us three more reasons, three more incentives, three more motivations, if you will, to give the more earnest heed to the things which we've heard coming from the Word of God. Three more reasons to believe. Number one, that the Word spoken by angels was steadfast. Verse two, the world to come will be in subjection to Jesus. Verse five, and number three, Jesus tasted death for every man. Mind you now, the apostle is writing to a group of people who will not, had not, who knows if they will or not, commit themselves to Christ. That's the important thing. Religion can take you from here to there. Only Christ can take you to heaven. Bottom line. Number one, the word spoken by angels was steadfast. Now, in chapter 1, verses 4 through 14, we've already seen, Paul contrasted or compared Jesus and the angels of God. There's an innumerable number of angels. There's not but one Son of God. And Paul showed us in this first chapter here that Jesus plainly, and I'll borrow a tacky word, but He outranks the angels. Jesus outranks the angels. That's why the angels of God worshipped Him. Amen? But having said that, Paul now reminds his Hebrew audience that these angels' words were steadfast. They were firm. They were stable. They were sure. In other words, when they said something, it was so. And that's why, those of you familiar with the Old Testament uh, book of God, when an angel told somebody something, it was true. It was God's message. It was God's word. And it happened. Do you remember a fellow by the name of Lot? Lot. Genesis 19, verse number 1. I've got several uh, references here. You can turn there if you like to, but I'm going to hurry through them for time's sake. Genesis 19.1, there came two angels to Sodom at even. Verse 13, these two angels said, We will destroy this place because the Lord has sent us to destroy it. Verse 24, the Lord reigned upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. The Lord, excuse me, the angel said it. His word was steadfast. It happened. Right? Just ask Lot. How about, you remember a fellow by the name of Manoah? 
Manoa. We don't know what his wife's name was. We call her Mrs. Manoa. Judges chapter 13, verse number 3. The angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman and said unto her, Behold, now thou art barren, and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive, and bear a son. Verse 24. And the woman bare a son, and called his name Samson. Why was that? Because the word of angels is steadfast. It works. They don't, they don't lie. They wouldn't make good politicians. Right? What they say is the truth. Okay. How about Zacharias? Come on up in the New Testament. Countless other uh, examples we can look at. Zacharias, Luke chapter 1, verse number 19. The angel said unto him, I am Gabriel, that stand in the presence of God, and am sent to speak unto thee, and to show thee these glad tidings. Then comes verse 20. Behold, thou shalt be dumb, and not able to speak, until the day that these things shall be performed, because thou believest not my words. Verse 22. When he came out of the temple, he could not speak unto them. Why? Again, because the word of angels is steadfast. So, Paul reminds these people that when these angels, who were outranked by Jesus, said something, it really did happen. So by comparison then, he implies here that obviously when Jesus, who outranks these angels, said something, then it too really would happen. Jesus told Nicodemus chapter 3, book of John, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You remember that one? God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He that believeth not on Him is, is excuse me, he that believeth on Him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. That's what Jesus said. Peter, later, speaking Jesus' words, said, Acts 4, verse 10, Be it known unto you and all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set in all of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name given under heaven among men, whereby we must be saved. So Paul gives the Hebrew another reason, another incentive, another motivation, if you will, to give the more earnest heed. The words spoken by even the outranked angels was steadfast. But then he tells us, secondly, verse 5, the world to come will be in subjection to Jesus. Now, if you're reading that verse, you realize this is what's implied here and not stated verbatim. But the implication is just that. Now, this world, the place we're living in right now, and all Bible believers know this, is not all there is. Amen? Anybody glad about that? Amen. Everyone has a birth date, and everyone will have a death date. My wife informed me not long ago, on her tombstone, do not put her birth date. So why not? Well, then they'll know how old I was. When you're dead, what difference does it make? Any, anybody? Just you men, can, can you commiserate? We all have a birth date, we're all going to have a death date, but there is a world to come. A world to come, quote unquote. None of us here have been there. All of us here will be there. The world to come. Now this world commenced Genesis chapter 1, verse number 9. You say, do you really believe that Genesis account? Do you really believe there's such a thing as in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth? Absolutely. If I had four more hands, I'd raise them. 
And in verse 9 we're told there, God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place. Let dry land appear. It was so. God called the dry land earth. That's this world. And it began almost 6,000 years ago in Genesis 1 verse number 9. But this world is going to end. Amen. Get that in, uh, information from the same book. 2 Peter chapter 3 verse number 10. The day of the Lord, Peter said, is going to come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also, and all the works therein shall be burned up. Ain't that pretty? That ain't very pretty. But it's the truth. This world had a beginning. This world's going to have an end. How about the world to come? The world to come. It exists already, though none of us have been there. It has existed from eternity past. By the way, that's the world God lives in. Amen? Amen. This world to come, though, will commence experientially. It's existed from eternity past. But it will commence experientially. In other words, we're going to practically find out about this world to come. John chapter 5, verse number 28. Jesus said, The hour is coming, into which all that are in the grave shall hear His voice, and they shall come forth. Anybody here really believe that? Yeah. You need to. But if you choose not to, I promise you the day's coming, you will. Yeah. Okay? You may pinch yourself a dozen times, but anyway. They'll come forth. They that have done good under the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil under the resurrection of damnation. The world to come has existed for all of eternity. But the world to come will exist, if you will, experientially, when all hear the voice and come up out of the the world to come. Hebrews 6, 5 says that believers have already tasted of the powers of the world to come. Anybody here ever had a, a non-believer, uh, a lost person, or a, vac a backslidden person roll their eyes at you when you've tried to tell them something about Christ? You know what I'm talking about? And I guess that there are those who roll their eyes, but you just don't see it. Because the stuff just sounds too far flung to possibly believe. Y'all, I'm a Christian today uh, because that day so many years ago, uh, in applying scripture after the fact to what I experienced, someone came along and seemed to be knocking on a door inside of here. And I opened that thing up by his a power in His grace. And I experienced something I never experienced before. I didn't buy it. I didn't trade it. I didn't pick it up because somebody lost it. But I experienced And you did the same thing. Amen? Yeah. And that's why when you sit in a service like this, God can even use Jethro Bodine to stand up here and preach. But when the truth is examined, something in here is touched. And it ain't me. All we know, the best we know, is that you are tasting the powers of the world to come. It's not just a rousing eloquence. It's the idea that there is truth that is eternal. And though you haven't seen the world to come, you know that you know that you know that there is a world to come and you've got reservations for that world. Even now, it's real and it's good. I've never been sorry that I got saved. Amen. Not once. Y'all amen good over here. I'll get back with y'all in a few minutes. I'm just teasing. Everybody amens. I like it all. The word power there comes from the Greek word dunamis. Which is where we get our word dynamite. Everybody likes to talk about we poor deluded Christians as that crowd that can get turned on by pie in the sky, by and by when we die, after you fly, and so on and so forth. Yo, the power of the world to come is something so tangible. 
unpredictable, so real, that God chose to use a word that we would one day here in America use to describe a little stick that you light a match to it and can blow a stump right up out of the ground. It's not intangible. It's reality. Amen. The world to come. We've not seen it, yo, but we felt of its power. Thank God for it. And this world, in this world to come, Jesus will be the undisputed Lord and all will be in subjection to him. I have to take that by faith, y'all. I mean, we're living in a world where Jesus is not subjected the entire world, uh, you know, evidently to himself. He does control everything. We realize we got people, we got churches today that don't even worship Jesus. What in the world do we expect out of the rest of this crowd running around? But by faith I know that in the world to come, Jesus is going to have everything in subjection to himself. Interesting word, subjection. i got to tread real easy here because we have a Greek scholar amongst us. I'm embarrassed. I wrote it down and I thought, George's going to be here. I can't use that word. <laughs> I'm sure this is mispronounced. Hupo tasso. Hupo tasso. Compound word. Hupo means under. Tasso means to arrange in an orderly fashion. The world to come will be arranged in an orderly fashion under Jesus. It ain't going to be no hodgepodge thrown together. Try to get them to come in and agree if you want to. Uh -uh. Somebody put it this way. This world to come and the, the government that Jesus will uh, use to control it. No committees. No three branches of government. No elections. No terms of office. No impeachments. No resignation. No overthrows. No two-party systems, no vetoes, no traitors, no disobedience, no discontents. Jesus is going to have everything arranged orderly under his absolute control. Amen. Say, man, that don't even sound good to me. That's a good indication you're not like you ought to be with Christ. Huh? Hey, there's nothing about Jesus that's nothing but sweet. Thought of Jesus running your life bothers you, good chance you need to do some repenting and get some things up here squared away. Oh, don't you just love wasting your money, getting drunk, and being blown out of your mind, and hurting people, and hurting your wife, and carousing in illegal ways? Don't you just love that? No, I don't love it. Neither should anybody in their right mind. That's why Christ can come in and straighten up. All that foolishness is, that's in there. Romans 14, 11. It is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, every tongue shall confess to God. Amen. Philippians 2, 9. God also hath highly exalted him, Christ, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It's going to be a world where everything is orderly arranged under Christ. Don't you look forward to that? Everybody's saying, well, good night. You mean everybody's going to be in heaven then, right? Oh, no. Uh-uh. In fact, we just read John 5, 29. In fact, let me go back over there so I don't misquote it. <clears throat> 5, 29. They that have done evil were raised to the resurrection of damnation. Now, we're not giving a lot of details here. I'm going to go to Revelation chapter 20, though, and pick up a couple of uh, thoughts. Even in the underworld, if you will, Revelation 20, verse number 12, things are going to be arranged the way Jesus said they were going to be. Everything is subjection. 12, 20, excuse me, 2012, book of Revelation. John said, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. The books were open. 
And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Verse 15, whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Somebody said, well, I don't want to go. It won't matter. Anybody here old enough to remember that when Daddy said do something, you did it, whether you liked it or not? Anybody that old in here? Now we call social services. My daddy would have said, call anybody you want to. I'm fixing the clobberize you. And then you'll do what I tell you to do. You may have to call 911, help tote you to the bedroom, but no. Now listen, somehow, some way, ain't nobody going to want to go to hell, but everybody that's not in the book of life is going to go there because Jesus will have the world to come in total subjection. We're going to have us a rally. We won't go. We won't go. God will probably send one of the fifth string angels to straighten that little problem out. Here you go. There you go. Bingo. Subjection, y'all. It's going to be like that. What a glorious thing. Well, how about those in heaven? Well, Jesus told us, chapter 5, verse 29. Those that hear his voice, wait to the resurrection of life. But I want to give you one more verse. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse number 16. The Lord himself descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Verse 17. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Those down below, those up above, everything's going to be arranged orderly under the domain of Christ. So Paul gives the Hebrew. Another reason, another incentive, another motivation to give the more earnest heed to what you've heard. Because one... The word of the angels who are outranked by Jesus was steadfast. Number two, the world to come is going to be in subjection to Jesus. But then number three from verse number nine. Jesus tasted death for every man. Jesus tasted death for every man. Now remember, what would appear to be the theme of this entire book is make your mind up. You know, you've got religion running out of your ears, it's dripping off your fingers. But you need to make your mind up about Jesus. Is he going to be your Lord? Or is he just going to be your homeboy, your pal, your buddy? Jesus tasted death for every man. We all know. In fact, Hebrews chapter 9. Let me just skip over there right quick. Verse 27. Everybody's going to die. Does that surprise anybody? Another statistic. 10 out of 10 died. It's appointed unto man. Men wants to die after this, the judgment. You know, we got an appointment with death. Death is not an accident. Oh, poor fellow, had an accident and died. Well, that may be the way it looks like here, but the breath of life is in God's hand. Amen. And when he says it's time to roll, guess what? You roll. Yeah. You can lock your brakes up if you want to. Slam down the emergency brake if you dare to. Call anybody you want to to try and fix you. But when God says it's time, you're gone. Amen. And if you're lost, that's bad news. If you're saved, that's good news. That's better than lunch. Got an appointment to check out of this world and go to the world that's to come. But you know what? Even though 927 says all are going to die, all do not have to taste death. Some of y'all want to roll your eyes real bad, but you're afraid I'll use you as an illustration. <laughs> What is this? I'm going to die, but I ain't going to taste death. You know? I like your daddy used to tell you, if you don't like it, pinch your nose and eat it anyway. I could still taste it, but you know what? I still ate it. Some of y'all ain't old enough to remember days like that. 
John 11. Let me go over there. You remember Jesus has been called on the scene by some grieving sisters. Their beloved brother has died. And Jesus purposely waited so that he would die. Answer that one. 1125, Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believeth that? They said, what in the world? Yo, I don't know how all this fits together. But I know it fits together. And I know that if Jesus tells me that if I believe in Him, I'll never die, then 927 Hebrews fits right along with that at some point in time, in some way known only by God and those who have already gone on, this poor old body is going to breathe its last breath. But the thing walking around in this body will just start breathing. I don't know how it's going to work, but it don't matter to me. How? My truck out there, that thing beeps. It's, it uh, whistles. It, it does things that I don't understand. I got in there one day, and it's got this picture of a little short, fat, bow-legged man. <laughs> and right under it in flashing red letters, airbag. Airbag. And I thought, I'm paying for you. Why, you can't talk to me that way. <laughs> I don't understand it. Then it told me your right rear tire is low of air. And I thought, how do you know that? <laughs> and they told me, you got a computer. My computer won't even print what I tell it to print, and you tell me it can tell me my right rear tire's low of air. That's beyond me, y'all. I don't know how. But Jesus says, listen, i got a deal for you that you'd be a fool to miss. This body will lay down, but you don't ever need to taste death if you don't want to. The word taste there, I looked it up. I thought Brother George is really going to have something to deal with me. It means taste. You know, like hot dog, chili dog, hats. Mm. That's good. Asparagus, fish, persimmon. No, yeah, that's bad. I don't want to taste that. Jesus said, the Word of God said, Jesus tasted that thing for you. And he tasted that thing for me. Now dying on this side, best I can figure, looks pretty much the same. I've seen saints check out. I've seen unsaved, lost, check out. On this side, it appears about the same. Y'all, it's at that point of death and the very next step that all similarities cease. According to the Word of God. <laughs> In fact, let me go. Luke 22. No, oh, I like this. And it's, you ever know that I come across the other day, a uh, verse that said, and, and they that are fat shall praise the Lord. <laughs> I hate to admit it, but I got a favorite verse. <laughs> and this is one of my favorite the older I get. Luke 16. I've got to hush so I can concentrate on finding chapter 16. 22. The beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. A lot of folks like to get tangled up. What is Abraham's bosom? I don't know. I don't care. The part I like is carried by the angels. So see, mom, dad, junior, whoever's laying around there watching you, sitting around there watching you lay in bed, there he be, with a snowboard, poor old fellow, the tears coming down, two great big strapping angels evidently got you one on one arm and one on the other, and off toward glory you go! That's what the Bible says. I said, well, I ain't so sure I believe it. You 
know what I'm sure about? You need to! Make your blooming mind up, y'all! Anybody here getting younger? Anybody here figure out a way not to die? Yeah, my life insurance man, he's got me covered. He's got you buffalo is what he's got you. Oh, she'll be a tall cop when you're gone, but you're going to go nonetheless. That's a good verse there, y'all. But then there's another one. Luke 16, 22, last of the verse, rich man died and was buried, verse 23, and in hell he lifted up his eyes. And see, on this side, dying saints and dying sinners look about the same, best I've been able to tell in most cases. But just at that point, all similarities cease. The angels grab one, and in hell the other one lifts up his eyes. Mm. Yo, that's why we got liberals. Because this don't taste good. I would rather edit it and come up with something that suits me better. Hey Amen. I, I think I'll become a liberal. Can't do that. If I could, I'd, I'd do it for the IRS. That's, that's where I do some editing. And anyway, April 15th. What's the difference between the two? Obviously. Jesus of the Bible has been embraced by the one. Jesus of the Bible has been rejected by the one. They may look the same at the point of death, but immediately after that point, similarities cease, and it all hinges on Christ of the Bible. Again, I don't know how it works, y'all. But Jesus says that he tasted death so that I don't have to. I, I hate to be foolish, y'all, but it's just in my nature. Anybody here ever bit a persimmon? I'm talking about a, a, a green. It's a memorable experience. <laughs> a crab apple? Why would anybody call that a crab apple? That's dumb. I don't know what you ought to call it, but not an apple. An apple's good. Uh, they got this kind of juice out now. Anybody simply apple? Simply so and so. Real good, just pure apple of man. It's just like pure crab apple? <laughs> pure persimmon? I, I can taste that thing as I stand here. I'm probably going to lose some of y'all. As a boy, we used to go raccoon hunting. <laughs> called coon hunting. And you get out there with a bunch of men in the middle of the night, they got all these little snot-nosed kids running around, oh, this is fun, this is fun. And they send us up the tree, they send us to go get the coon that ain't dead yet. You know how all that went. Well, the coons love persimmon. <laughs> Finally hollered too loud, I broke them. The, uh, the coon would love the persimmon, so we'd follow up along to a persimmon tree looking for the coon. And sure enough, those men, y'all boys, you need to get you some of them. These taste real good. Amen? Uh, it's like it starts taking all the juice off your tongue. Your mouth gets to dry. Your tongue starts. I don't think I'm going to be able to finish my message. <laughs> The thought of somebody being able to come along and take that taste out of your mouth once it's there, that'd be a welcome sight. Amen. And yo, you'll forgive me for being foolish, but what little bit we know about dying and what's on the other side, the thought of someone who'd be willing to come along and taste that part of it for me, that would, that would equal motivation. That would equal incentive. That would equal one more reason to get square with Jesus. Listen, I know Jesus has been totally misrepresented in a lot of ways by a lot of us, I'm sure. Preacher's the worst. But that doesn't change what's in here. I mean, he's real, y'all. And everything said about him in here is real. And he's only good. And he only helps. And he only wants you. R 
facing a generation today of youngsters who want to know well, what's in it for me. I hate to pop anybody's bubble, but this ain't the first generation. What's in it for me? Jesus created us to serve him. It'll only be good, but even if it won't, y'all, he's still Lord. And he's got a claim on your life and on my life. And the word of God is right full of reasons to embrace him. We ask you to bow with me this morning.